The IPCC tell us we've got fewer than 12 years to completely transform the way our global civilization operates if we're to stand any chance of avoiding their catastrophic social, environmental and existential consequences of runaway atmospheric warming. We're told we need to reach a net carbon zero position somewhere between 2040 and 2050, which means rapidly eliminating the use of fossil fuels, moving predominantly towards renewable energies, changing the way we build our homes, towns, cities and transport infrastructure, and transforming the way we feed ourselves. So how are we doing? Well, according to the International Energy Agency, global energy consumption in 2018 increased at nearly twice the average rate of growth since 2010, Oil demand rose by 1.3%, led by the United States. Natural gas consumption grew by 4.6%, its largest growth since 2010, again led by the USA, but followed closely by China. And overall, global energy-related CO2 emissions didn't reduce. They actually went up by another 1.7% to an historic high of 33.1 gigatons. It's just not going to happen, is it? But what if we've been looking in the wrong direction for the radical short-term solution that we apparently so desperately need? What if we've been just a little bit too preoccupied with the second most powerful greenhouse gas in our atmosphere and forgotten to consider the most powerful greenhouse gas? What if the answer actually lies in water? Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Back in 1978, the then US President Jimmy Carter asked the Scripps Institute to advise him on the causes of, and solutions to, the global warming issue that was by then already becoming very difficult to ignore. Water vapour is by far the most powerful greenhouse gas in our atmosphere. There's about a hundred times more of it up there than there is CO2, and it's about seven or eight times more effective at capturing the heat that leaves the surface of our planet. But in their response to President Carter, the Scripps Institute factored out water vapour and placed all their advisory emphasis on the CO2 concentrations in our atmosphere. Why? Because they knew that human beings were responsible for the rise in CO2 concentrations since pre-industrial times, and that it was mainly this rise that was causing the increase in temperatures. They also knew that it was still within the ability and control of human beings to bring about the necessary reductions in CO2 concentrations as long as the social and political will was there. By contrast, they stated two main reasons why they felt there was little point in trying to predict or control the effects of water vapour on our warming climate. Firstly, they said that water is such an overwhelmingly dominant force in our global climate systems that it was inconceivable that human beings could possibly have made any significant impact on its mechanisms and influence. And secondly, they concluded that the movement of water around our planet and the consequent effects of that movement were so hugely variable in both time and physical space that it was practically impossible to create any predictive mathematical modelling that would be of any help anyway. So our global leaders made the perfectly rational and pragmatic decision to control what they could control, and the focus was placed squarely on carbon dioxide reductions. Unfortunately, despite that apparent focus, our collective efforts at reducing our carbon dioxide emissions in the 40 years since that report came out have amounted to nothing short of a catastrophic failure. More recently though, there's been a growing realisation that we humans do in fact have at least some ability to affect the way that water and water vapour influence our planet's climate. This guy is Walter Jenner. Walter is an Australian climate scientist and soil microbiologist and director of Healthy Soils Australia. His research over many years has brought him to the firm conclusion that our only hope of short-term climate mitigation is to fundamentally change the way we manage our land, which in turn will bring about a radical transformation in the levels of water and carbon that our soils are able to retain. In April 2018, Walter delivered a lecture at Harvard University on what he calls the soil carbon sponge, and I'll leave a link to the video of that lecture in the description box below. It's a fascinating presentation based on the principles of something called regenerative agriculture. I highly recommend you go and have a look at it, but it is two hours and nine minutes long, which probably means that not everyone will find the time to watch the whole thing. So in this two-part video, we're going to offer a potted version of the science that Walter takes us through in his presentation. So grab a drink, settle in, and let's get into it. 
About 420 million years ago, our planet consisted of water in the oceans, containing the first rudimentary life forms, and dry land in the form of rock that had no life on it at all. But those rocks did contain essential nutrients like phosphorus, calcium, zinc and magnesium. The rock was made up of particles that were densely packed together and if water hit the surface of those rocks, it would simply run off. But as it did so, it would leach out tiny amounts of nutrients. And life in the oceans relied on the leaching of these nutrients for them to use to drive their various basic life processes. As always, competition for food drove evolution, so any life form that could solubilise the nutrients out of the rock instead of waiting for them to arrive in the water found that they had a significant competitive advantage. The first life form to manage this was called cytoplasm, which together with enzymes formed into long tubes that we know as fungi. But fungi didn't get far on their own because they can't generate their own energy. Only plants can do that using the quite miraculous process that we call photosynthesis. Plant life in the oceans took the form of blue-green algae. So over evolutionary timescales, the fungi and the blue-green algae combined in a symbiotic relationship to form what we call lichens. And without any competition on the land, the lichens were able to spread rampantly. As the lichens solubilized the rocks, the rock particles got moved apart, leaving air gaps. And as lichens grew and moved on, they left behind organic detritus, which filled the gaps between the particles and acted like tiny little bed springs. That detritus could also hold water, and so over time, through a process called pedogenesis, the rock was transformed into an absorbent spongy material, about two thirds of which was just thin air. This stuff had a far greater surface area available for nutrients, and the air gaps meant roots could travel far further down below the earth. And that material is, of course, what we now call soil. Within about 100 million years, the planet was in a period known as the Carboniferous Permian, with lush forests teeming with life. And once our planet had soil, all the elements were in place to produce an evolutionary explosion in plant life, from lichens to mosses to ferns, through to the seed plants like cycads, gymnosperms, angiosperms, and eventually, about 50 million years ago, along came the grasses. Carbon was being drawn out of the atmosphere by the plants and fixed in the soil by the fungi using sugars that they got from the plants in exchange for the carbon. And so the symbiosis continued. So much carbon was drawn down into the soil that the atmospheric concentrations of CO2 went from a starting point of about 8,000 parts per million to only about 100 parts per million towards the end of the period. And evolving alongside all of that were the insects and the herbivores. Fast forward a few hundred million years to our current predicament. This is a chart called the Keeling Curve. It shows atmospheric CO2 concentrations based on observational readings taken at Mauna Loa in Hawaii since 1958. There's a seasonal pattern that you can see. The planet gives off CO2 in the winter and draws it back down again during the summer, predominantly driven by the northern hemisphere, simply because that's where most of the ice-free land is located. Every year, plants draw down 120 billion tonnes of carbon into their biosystems. Trouble is, every year the Earth re-emits 130 billion tonnes of carbon back up into the atmosphere. So we've got a deficit of 10 billion tonnes every year, and that's what's causing the graph to go up. We also know that the amount of energy reaching the top of our troposphere from the Sun, something scientists call incident solar radiation, averages 342 watts per square metre. That's the energy coming into our planetary system. Simple logic says that if we want that planetary system to remain at a constant temperature, then we need to find a way of radiating the same 342 watts per square metre back out into space. The trouble is that the increase in greenhouse gases means we're only actually getting rid of 339 watts per square metre. So there's three watts per square metre of warming going on all the time across the entire 510 million million square metres of our planet's surface. And that's a lot of warming. That extra energy has already caused about one degree Celsius of planetary warming since pre-industrial times. And the greenhouse gases that are already up in the atmosphere will continue to absorb energy and heat our planet for a very long time. Right now, there's as much as another degree or so of further warming locked in that we haven't seen yet because of the time lag of the process. And the more we continue to pump out excess carbon dioxide into our atmosphere, the higher the temperature we lock into our system. 
Our current trajectory is towards about five degrees Celsius of warming by 2100. And there are plenty of videos you can watch or books you can read to find out how bad that would be. Seriously, if you don't know how bad that would be, I strongly suggest you find out, especially if you've got children. So our challenge is not simply to remove the deficit of 10 billion tons of carbon per year, but actually to do far more than that in an effort to reverse the extra warming that we're currently locking in. That probably means removing more like 20 billion tons of carbon every year. It certainly doesn't look like we're going to achieve that in 12 years by cutting out fossil fuels, because despite the Herculean efforts of the renewable energy industries, we simply are not reducing our global fossil fuel use. In fact, as we saw earlier, we're actually increasing it. So what's Walter Jenner's master plan for achieving our short-term goal? Well, according to the United Nations Environment Programme, or UNEP, the surface area of our planet where plants can carry out the work of fixing carbon into the soil is only about half the size it was some eight to 10,000 years ago. And that's not because that land is now covered in cities and human beings. That infrastructure actually only accounts for about 1% of the ice-free land surface. No, it's because in those eight to 10,000 years, human agricultural and livestock management techniques have been so misguided and profligate that they've created five billion hectares of desert and wasteland out of once fertile soil. But Walter Jenner argues that all that land and all those biosystems can be regenerated simply by copying what nature did when life first got going outside of our oceans. In fact, he tells us it's as simple as ABC. Here's how he explains the theory. A is for agriculture. This is what humans can observe and easily manage above the soil. Humans dominate this process and manage it to maximize the crop yield. But this top bit is only 30% of the overall biomass of the system. There's another 30% of the biomass in the root system and the final 30 to 40% is kicked out or exudated as sugars and amino acids. And these are critical to drive the microbial and fungal ecology that makes the springy detritus between the soil particles that we looked at earlier and keep the whole system spongy and absorbent. The fungi grow in long filaments called fungal hyphae, which create a huge surface area for nutrients to pass between the plants and the microbial life around the roots. Jenna tells us that in a healthy soil, there can be 25,000 kilometers of fungal hyphae in a single cubic meter of soil, and that's twice the diameter of our planet. And that microbial ecology includes not just the fungi, but bacteria, protozoas, actinomycetes, nematodes, columbola, earthworms, and all the other creepy crawlies, all contributing to the constant cycling of nutrients around a healthy soil. There's reckoned to be about 10 times the weight of organic life in a healthy soil than the animals living and grazing above it. Our modern day profit oriented farming practices focus solely on maximizing the crop yield at all costs. And so we engage in what Walter Jenner describes as moron techniques. The first of these is clearing and burning. Of the 8 billion hectares of primary forest that originally existed on Earth, human beings have cleared 6.3 billion hectares and only regenerated about 1.8 billion. So we're now left with only 3.5 billion hectares and every year we're burning 10% of what's left, about 350 million hectares. And we also burn about 2 billion hectares of grassland, crop stubble and rangelands every year. The second moron technique is cultivation. Cultivation exposes the soil to UV radiation, which kills microorganisms. And thirdly, we over fertilize the land with nitrates. Every gram of excess nitrate oxidizes 30 grams of carbon. We also irrigate the land, which restricts fungal growth and slows productivity. We traditionally keep land fallow for periods of time, ostensibly to help it recover. But in fact, this is essentially a starvation regime for the microbes and fungi in the soils. No plant growth means no sugars. So the soil's ecosystem grinds to a halt. And last, but by no means least, we add biocides, which basically kill everything in the soil. More than 40% of the net global value of agriculture is invested in these practices and inputs. And yet, according to Walter Jenner, every single one of these practices results in more and more soil carbon being oxidized back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And as the carbon leaves the soil, the fungi have nothing left to trade with the plants, which means no more springy detritus between the soil particles, 
no more air gaps for root systems to travel easily through, and so the soil collapses back to useless, compacted, impervious material, and we humans are left with dust bowls and deserts. According to Walter, our future literally depends on the BC ratio. In other words, how much carbon we burn or oxidize back to CO2, and how much carbon we fix into the soil to maintain healthy absorbent material for future growth. And in part two of this video, we'll look at how the regenerative agriculture practices that Walter Jenner talks about can manage this balance, and we'll discover some of the dividends that could potentially transform our planet's temperature and climate. See you in part two.